uh, you know, I heard a church story one time about a church that was pretty seasoned. And uh, what happened is the church started getting this infestation of rats. And they were coming throughout the church. And it got so bad that the numbers started dwindling in the church. And so there was a board meeting between the elders and the pastor because they were getting very worried. They were like, okay, this church has rats. We've called distinguishers. What are we going to do? And so one of the elders stood up, banged the table, and said, this is the judgment of God. This is what happens when we aren't being faithful. There's men in here living in sin. You need to confess. That's why we have rats. And another man of God stood up, and he just kind of pushed that guy and said, how could you say that? God is faithful. This, this is just a work of the enemy. This is the devil trying to attack this church. He's trying to destroy us. And so this is purely a work of the enemy. And a conflict broke out. Because you have one side that said this is God's judgment. And there's another side that said this is the enemy. And so this rat issue was becoming a big problem. So everybody kind of looked towards the pastor at some point. And so the pastor being a man of God and being very close. I mean, this man was known to have a very really deep connection with God. He said, you know what, I'm going to go home. I'm going to pray and fast this whole week and I will come back with an answer. So the church adjourned, and they making adjourned, and they came back next week. And so the elders, uh, being very faithful, the church said, what did God tell you? What did God tell you? The pastor rose and said, God has answered me. We're going to offer the rats membership, and they're only going to come twice a year on Easter and Christmas, <laughs> prom songs. So uh, I, I was really encouraged by that story. Anyway, I'm going to my feedback, please. Anyway, so as you know, we as a church... We have our own situations, and I believe, as a church, we, we all come from our own background. We all have our own situation, our personal lives, and when we come to church, I believe that God should give us an answer. That I think more than just you know, stories and jokes, we want to really dig in. And uh, you know, I, I told you that from the very beginning, the outset of this ministry was to empower each of us to go outside and to be like Christ. And whatever he did, and wherever Jesus went, he met the needs of the people, you know, even the adulterer. You know, they were ready to kill her. And Christ uniquely broke through. With not even just a sign or miracle. He just said, tell you what, you guys are so judgmental. You'll go ahead. Who are the first who without sin go ahead and throw a stone? And he literally saved her. So Christ continues to show ways to, to be a, a light to this world in a variety of manners. It wasn't just an argument. He just showed by love he could do many things. But as we continue to grow this church and begin our new journey... What I want to do, as I said uh, two weeks ago, is we want to start to create some foundational truths. And with those truths, I believe that when we get that foundation built, even Paul says in Corinthians, as a wise master builder, you know, he had plans from God. He was able to build that church. And so I believe that if we can get some basic truths into everybody, that we can begin to go and understand deeper truths of God, and we can begin to work the way Christ did for his church, for his people, those who are called to minister to. You know, I talked to you many times, I believe many of you guys are called to minister to your workplace. If you are at a job, that means God gave you that job. I believe that God has called you there to minister there. Either to the, even one co-worker's marriage stage is an amazing thing. So, as we begin tonight, I want to remind everybody what the goal is, what our vision is. And to re- just to kind of repeat myself, it's to, to literally encourage, to train, to raise up people inside this church to go outside and be like Christ. So the scripture I want to talk about tonight is going to come from, our, from John chapter 3. John chapter 3, of course, everybody remembers, is very famous because it's the, uh, the new birth. Everybody are familiar with that. Everybody likes John 3.16. But John chapter 3 is very famous being, you know, the scripture about being born again, being born again. And that, that famous scripture there uh, begins with a conversation with Nicodemus. And, uh, between him and Jesus. Before I start there, before I begin, um, I know we're talking about stories here, but I want to give just one more story. I think that will give us an idea before we begin tonight. It's a simple story. I'll, uh, I'll show you guys that when you have this story in mind, we'll begin the message. In the Old Testament, there's a story about a young boy. He's a young boy. He keeps sheep. So he's a keeper of sheep. And he's outside. He's the youngest brother of many brothers. And as he's keeping sheep, he has a family. And they're not rich. The Bible doesn't say anything about him being rich or special or anything. But while he's out there attending his sheep with his family, another man named Samuel has a conversation with God. And God tells this man, Samuel, who is a prophet, I want you to go and tell a young guy that he's about to become a king. Now, this young boy has no clue that this conversation is happening. But outside of his knowledge, 
a man of God and God himself are having a conversation. And that guy identifies him as a king. And from that moment on, God saw that young boy as a king. It had nothing to do with David. David wasn't aware of it. But from that moment on, David, I I use the name, but David became a king. So David had no clue this was happening. And that's a scriptural story that is alive today. We talk about Jesus Christ being son of David. And so that story is going to illustrate my sermon today very simply this. We have an identity with Christ, whether we know it or not. A conversation happened between God and Jesus to choose us. And I'm going to show you why that's so pivotal. When you understand who you are in Jesus, then everything becomes easier. At least at the very onset, you'll, be, you'll understand that everything you've been chosen for has already been given to you. And that conversation happened, not necessarily in your hearing, but it, it was set in motion, and nothing's going to stop it. As much as David was chosen king by Samuel, without David's understanding, without his awareness, it had to come to light. You've been chosen, and I'm going to show you what's important. Let's look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3, if everybody wants to start with me. We'll start with the first few verses. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and from the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's John chapter 3. Now, I want to look at this conversation, but let's open a prayer, and we're going to get started. Lord, I know that your Spirit is here, and God, where you are, your name is here. We thank you, Jesus, for this meeting. We thank you for... Uh, Willow Meadows Baptist Church and all their help, Lord God. But today, Lord, there's a, there's a great calling that you want to set forth into motion and you want to show us who we are in Jesus Christ and you want to show us what you did for us on that cross and how much it means. Lord God, I pray for the ears to hear. Lord God, that you would fill them with the Spirit of God as we speak, Lord God, and you would show them, you would open their eyes. Lord, let not this just be a message about words, but let it be the kingdom of God become real and manifest in their lives, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So this is an interesting scripture. Now, I've read this from as many years as I can count. You must be born again. We say we're born again Christians, right? I think everybody in here is going to say, we're born again. We're born again by the blood of Jesus. But I read this just today, and I looked at it again. And okay, so what does it start with? It says, Nicodemus says very clearly, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. No one can do these signs unless God is with him. And he says, we know that you're from God. Simple as that. That's fair. I mean, that's a good question, right? We see Jesus Christ, and he begins to do all these things for the people, lost people. He didn't care if they were saved. He healed lepers. He healed sick people. He preached the gospel. His goal was to bring them into heaven, to redeem them. So he says, well, man, he's basically asking, how do you do that? We know you're from God. What are you doing? Like, what, what is this that you're doing? This is new to us. And Jesus gives an answer that doesn't make sense. And hopefully I'll tell you what makes sense today. He said, you must be born again. Does that let me, okay, if I, if I prayed for somebody and they got healed, and you ask me, Michael, I'd like to pray for the sick too. I said, you must be born again. That's kind of a weird answer, right? He basically says this. What is flesh is flesh, and what is spirit is spirit. You must be born again in the spirit. It's a strange answer the way I see it. He goes, man, I know you're from God. You're doing great things for Jesus. You're doing great things for God. We know you're from God. And he looks at him and says, you must be born again of the Spirit. I want to dissect that a little further. He said, what is Spirit is Spirit, and what is flesh is flesh. Okay? What is Spirit is Spirit. I want to tell you just three basic points tonight that I think 
when we're through now, you'll, you'll feel very different about your salvation. I think by the time we close this message, you'll see your salvation a little differently. Now, everybody in here is a product of their parents. I know that. Because you can't be created. You're a product of flesh. Your mom and dad came together, and you're a product of that. So what is flesh in this room is a product of flesh. Simple as that. That's what Jesus was saying. What is flesh, what you see, is a product of something fleshly. But what is spirit is a product of what is spirit. I'm going to tell you the first point is, when you came to know Jesus Christ, Jesus changed you completely. You have a new identity with Christ. You have a new identity with Jesus Christ. What do I mean? How did Christ come into this world? Right? We all know the story, right? Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 1. Both of them talk about how Mary was in a room, and the angel Gabriel came in and says something very clear. I'll, I'll read it to you if you'd like to hear it for, for what it is. It says that Mary, and she basically said, you're going to have a son. And she wasn't married yet, so she was a little confused. So Luke chapter 1, verse 34 says, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So what's the angel saying? He said the Holy Spirit is about to come on you. Okay? Matthew chapter 1 says, When Joseph, the father of David, was confused about this, I'm going to skip ahead. He says, Do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to slow down. i getting some stairs here. Jesus is a product of what? The Holy Spirit. Simple as that. A Holy Spirit touched Mary and created Jesus. So, you're a product of your parents. A man and a woman came together. You're a product of that. But your salvation is a product of what? The Holy Spirit. Do you see how you're more like Jesus than you realized? This is so key. I had to slow down here because we'll go ahead. But i, I got to make sure you get this. You're a product of the Holy Spirit, the way Jesus Christ is. Now, I'm not being sacrilegious. I know last week there was some comments made, so I want to be careful. I'm not calling you Jesus, but you are closer to Jesus than you ever realized. In you is the Holy Spirit. But how it came upon you, you were literally almost, I'm going to use the word carefully, you are conceived by the Spirit. John chapter 3, we said the new birth. You must be born again of the Spirit. Nicodemus was confused because he said, how can a man be born a second time? Does he go back to his mother? And Jesus was being a little tricky. He said, no, 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 Nicodemus, you don't get it. You're going to be born again of the Spirit. Jesus Christ is born of the Spirit. Does anybody agree with me? Does that, that make sense? You are born of the same Spirit that Jesus was. So when you came to know Jesus Christ for your salvation, you have a completely new identity. I'll, I'll explain it this way. My last name is Boaz, Michael Boaz. Jerry is Jerry John, Isaac Sarabia. Your, uh, the last name is a product of your parents. But when the Holy Spirit came on you, you have a new name. And the, the Revelation says, I'll give you a new name. But do you ever think about that? That if Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, that meant you were also conceived of the Spirit. Now, maybe not identical the way Mary was a virgin, but your salvation is a product of it. So you have a new identity. And I say this is key because we're going to continue going down this road for a long time. And I'm going to show you things that are going to be very advanced and very powerful. But it won't work if you don't know Jesus. But more than just confessing the name of Jesus, you've got to realize your salvation is a product of the Holy Spirit. You are literally created by the Spirit of God. The Spirit inside of you, has been, it's come from the Spirit. I'll show you. How did God originally design us? I'm going to tell you, this is what God wanted all along. I'm going to show you that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. That's a creation story, right? Now, we're talking about creation. Now, all of you guys are kids. In some sense, you are children of your parents. Genesis 1, 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created man. Male and female, he created them. Do you catch that? When God first made mankind on this earth, he intentionally said, be like me. So what I'm telling you from John 3, is that I'm not bending verses here. This is a restoration of this intentional design. You have to be Christ-like. God made you Christ-like. That was the plan all along. This idea says God made you the image of himself. Jesus Christ, when Philip asked him, hey, Jesus, I'd like to see the Father. He told Philip, man, have you been with me so long? I'm the image of God. 
Jesus is the image of God. We are made like Jesus who is in the image of God. Now this verse is funny too. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Do you realize that's circular? Do you realize he just said the same thing twice? Do you know why he said that? What does God call himself? I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I have the keys to hell and Hades and death and Hades. God saying, I started something, I'll finish it. Well, he started us this way. We had never sinned. If Adam didn't sin, we remain this way. And God came back and said, I'll finish it with Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? He started it and finished. He said it twice. Hebrew has its own thing. Do you remember even um, in Dan the book of Daniel, I'm going to take a side note, when the writing was on the wall, it said, uh, Mene, Mene, Tekel, a parson. Do you remember that? It, you know what the translation was? God counted it and finished it. He repeated the Hebrew to say he started and finished it. I'm going to shamelessly tell you, he started something and finished it. He started something for us. We dropped the ball. He brought it back through Jesus Christ. You've got to realize, when, when we talked about 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, I said, he who abides in Jesus must also walk like him. I told you that's our mandate for this church. And if you don't realize that Christ has made you like him, it's going to seem very difficult to be like Jesus in this world. It's going to seem like, man, you know, this guy's screaming at me. i got a co-worker around my back. i got another guy cussing me out of work. It may not seem very easy to do. But I'm telling you, if you begin to change your identity and see who you are as Christ instead of a fallen man, instead of seeing yourself as a multitude begging at the window and knocking, Jesus himself came to finish this for you. You realize that? He came to do this for you. He wanted you like him again. So it's not like we have to drum up something. He literally shoved himself in you. You don't have to try hard to be your parents' son. I don't have to be hard to be Michael Boaz. My parents created me, so I am Michael Boaz. I am my father's son. When God gave you his spirit, he supernaturally brought you back to the family of God. Do you see that? So you don't have to pre plead and pray. You don't have to beg God. God wanted you back. That's why he sent Jesus. He physically wanted you back. And I say physical because he sent his son to get, come get you. He didn't just talk. He's like, he could have called from heaven and said, hey, uh, you know, uh, Mark, why don't you come up here? He sent his son to come get us. That's how much he loves us. See, I'm lazy sometimes. I'm married. Okay, I'm married. And sometimes like, hey, princess, can you give me some water? Give me something. Like, Jesus could have done that. No, but he physically, like, he said, come here. And he yanked us and caught us back. That's how much Jesus loves us. And his love was more than talk, it's a reality and his spirit. So I know I spent a lot of time on this first point, but it's very key. I hope the next time you see yourself in prayer, you say, you know what, I'm like Jesus Christ. And that's not heresy. It was his plan. He wanted you back like him again. So it's not a bad thing to say that. That's what we say we're Christians. We're like Christ. I'm not saying I'm Jesus, that's heresy. But I'm like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus in my faith, in my walk, and my prayer, and the way I treat people. And my goal is the same goal Jesus has. I want to see people saved. I want to work the way Jesus worked. We don't have to separate ourselves. Sometimes we feel like, okay, only Jesus could have lived like that. Only He could only have been the only one to, to save somebody, to raise the dead, to open a blind eye, to heal somebody. But th the goal is for us to understand it. So we'll, we'll leave that alone, but I'm still going to hammer that in later on. That was the first point. You have to realize you have a new identity. I'll tell you what, there's books and books on this about new identity in Christ. The second point is I want to show you, God wanted to do it for you before you even knew him. Does it make sense? God wanted to do this before you knew him. I'll show you another verse. Romans 8, 29. Romans chapter 8, 29. I'll be up here. I'm going to be lazy. For whom he foreknew, we're talking about God here, for whom God knew before you knew him, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That might confuse you a little bit. What I'm telling you is, before you knew God, he actually ordained it for you that you would come back to him and be like Jesus. In prayer, you're not the old person you used to be. You're a new man. The way you see yourself in prayer is you have the image of Christ. And the Bible says very clearly, we have the righteousness of Christ. That gives us the ability to pray. Otherwise, we shouldn't have any ability to pray. And I'm telling you that all this because as we move on, as I challenge you guys to step out and to see the works of God, 
You have to get real clear who you are. I'll tell you why. The devil's really funny when it comes time to pray. I can tell you many times when I want to minister to somebody at work, a lot of thoughts begin to flood my mind and start coming in like a wave. What did I do wrong? Maybe I honked at somebody on the way to work. Maybe I cut some, all these thoughts come, especially when I want to do something for God, I want to do something for somebody else. This time of self-reflection kicks in. And I believe it's the devil coming to say, who are you to talk about Jesus Christ? Or who are you to say something good for God? Or who are you to share Christ with your job? And that, that funny thing is, sometimes we feel like, oh, you know, it's my conscience, the Holy Spirit is reminding me. There are times we need to confess to God in prayer. I agree. We need to always pray with God and be clear conscience. But when God knows you're about to minister to somebody, and the enemy comes in and puts a thought in your head, you need to remind yourself who you are with Jesus. That God has already given you an open door. That he came and yanked. Remember I said he physically came and showed up, pulled you back, and asked you to be in his family. And so the enemy finds a way to trick you. And so this is something we'll have to remember in the weeks to come, that God wanted you to do this. Because that's why he said, I'm predestined for you. I wanted you to. This is my plan along. I want to add something to the second point. Is God flesh or spirit? Spirit. God by default is spirit. The Bible says that. But God is a spirit. He's not fleshly. So when he identifies you, many of us, when we introduce ourselves, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm an engineer. There's an engineer, engineer, teacher, and some worker guys, teachers, and everything. We all have our profession. And we introduce ourselves like, oh, Mr. David, what do you do for a living? Well, I help out here at the church, things like that. That's good. But if God's spirit, how does he really identify you? By what's in here. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm going to help you just for a minute. When you go to pray, who does God see? Does he see an engineer? Does he see a husband? I don't think so. I mean, I know he knows it. But what is he really concerned about? He's concerned about what's in here. It will give you more confidence to pray. Because whatever you did or didn't do, well, whoever you are or aren't, that's just an extension. But God, the Bible says he's spirit, and we're spirit. Okay, let me rewind a little bit. As a person, you have three parts to you. You have your spirit. Right? You have your soul, and you have your body. The Bible told Adam, when he ate of the apple, if he were to eat of the tree of knowledge, you would die. That's right, right? He told him, don't touch it. Touch any, anything else that you want. But if you touch this tree, you'll die. Now, we both know that Adam and Eve ate it. But they were still talking and walking. That's kind of <laughs> funny, right? So what died? They still had emotions. The spirit man died. The spirit man died. So when when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, you must be born again. The Spirit was dead before. That's why I said you're conceived of the Spirit. You're, the Holy Spirit literally brought your spirit back to life. I have life as a body because my parents gave birth to me. But the Spirit of God had to give me life. So Jesus, sorry, with the, with the intention of the Holy Spirit was to give life back to you. So when God sees you as a spirit, he sees you alive like Christ. Do you follow that? Mm -hmm. See, when we talk about who's Michael Jordan, that's a basketball player. Who's Obama? He's the president of the nation. Who's Michael? He's talking. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, what God wants to know is your spirit man. That's why sometimes when we get caught up in works, works are good, but they're counted as dead. We're saved by grace. But when we get caught up in what we're doing for God, and then we expect God to act on our behalf and it doesn't happen, that's the disconnect that many of us have. We do something great for God, and it doesn't happen the way we think we should. Because of that disconnect, God's like, you don't get it just yet. I may answer you, but this is going to catch up with you later. We need to realize that God sees us as a spirit first. First and foremost, when we connect to God, is through our spirit. Because God is spirit. I'm not saying he's blind and can't see anything. He's like walking around like this. He's not doing that. He sees us. But the way we work with God, I'm telling you, is through the spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit in us is what cries out. Romans says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us as we pray. Because we don't pray as we need to. The Holy Spirit knows how we should pray. So there's a connection between God that's coming through our spirit. So do you see how critical identity is? We can't really go much further until I spend time explaining. When you begin to work with God, when you go outside to work with God, the spirit is what matters most. You may not have a seminary degree. You may not have been born in a Christian household. Do you see those things don't matter? They don't matter at all. So I told you, the first point is, God had given you an identity. 
I told you, God sees you in the spirit realm. Too often we get caught with what we see. Second Corinthians tells me that the fleshly things of this world are passing away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So the spirit realm, the spiritual matters of this world, God says that's eternal. That will matter for a much longer time than what we do in this world. I'm not writing off the works of God, but the spiritual realm matters. That's why it's so key. So I told you, the first thing I said is God wanted us to know how we were reborn through the Spirit. The second point I told you was God is Spirit. He wants to see us that way. The final thing I want to tell you guys is when He remade us, He blessed us more than we realized. I told you there was a story at the beginning about a young boy, right? Keeper of sheep. Everybody knows the story of David. Does everybody, for the most part? You know, he, his family was nobody. He was a nobody. He had no... There were, yeah, there was apparently a brother, six or seven. But they weren't, like, rich. They were keeping sheep. He was working. He was younger. And again, like I was telling you, in Hebrew days, the firstborn was the one that was blessed. The firstborn should have been the one chosen in any family... That's the one where the, the double portion goes. That's where the inheritance goes. David would have gotten the inheritance, but would have been like the first guy. So when God picked David, he was doing something very unique. See, David's a funny example. David continues to show something special in the Old Testament that was a, was a picture of what was God going to do in the New, New Testament. I'll say that one time. What you see God do with David was a good picture of what God was doing in the New Testament. I'll remind you. David had no clue he was about to become a king. He never heard the conversation. That was a private conversation between Samuel and God. But when that proclamation was made by God, it was set in stone. And David began to grow into who he was. When I tell you this message about identity, it may not click today, but you can grow in it. See, David wasn't on top of the world at that moment. But do you know where David was at the peak? The entire known nation, all the seven countries, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Gergeshites, the Philistines, do you know what? They all basically had to bow down before him. He was king. So David had to grow into who he was going to be. I'm telling you, we as a church, we as a people of God, must grow into who we're going to be. And I told you, you see that with David. When David started, there was no royalty in his family. He didn't know what was going on. It didn't matter who he was. God chose him. When we get to the New Covenant, we call it New Covenant Gathering. Let me tell you what God calls you. Remember, I told you, that God gave you a new identity, right? Up to now, I've been saying He's given you a new identity. You're like Christ, you're like Christ, you're like Christ. But God didn't stop there. Let me show you just how good God is. I'll read you a few verses. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It's talking about us. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who, were, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not attained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You know he's talking about us? That's, that's amazing. Do you think he's bragging about you? You don't look good. It's okay. But we're a chosen people. God says, I chose you. Remember, he physically went and got us. And he calls us a royal priesthood. We're like, okay, is that really tangible? Is that just a heaven thing? Does that matter? I would challenge you to take a step further in your faith and say, that's a reality. God is talking to you right now. If all the scriptures were only for us in heaven, I don't really see the point of the New Testament. We could just make it a few verses. I believe a lot of the New Testament is for us today. You might have remembered weeks ago I talked about how Jesus Christ came to fulfill the Old Testament and he fulfilled every bit of it that we as New Testament believers must fulfill the commands that Jesus gave us. So we are here to fulfill the New Testament. And I'll tell you, one of the first verses we need to fulfill is this verse that says we are what? We are chosen and we are royalty. And we're a priesthood, we're a holy nation, his own people that are special to him. And we are called to proclaim the praises of him. That was 1 Peter 2. Now, the New Testament has the three special characters. I always remember the kind of inner circle. There was Peter, and then there was James and John. But I'll tell you what, three of, uh, one guy I missed there is Paul. Paul says, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 8, he's talking about the Corinthians here. He says, you are already full, you are already rich, 
You have reigned as kings without us, and indeed, I, wish, I could wish you did reign, that we might reign with you. He says, you're reigning like kings. Now, I'm going to, I can't really delve in that today. I'm going to talk about kingdom and who we are and what authority looks like in the spiritual realm. But I'm just going to tell you just as a whole, just to, get start, just to kind of close up this message tonight, God called you royalty. Even though you had no royalty in your bloodline, some people think, what is this idea of royalty? Is that just people, God, people as Hebrew guys? No, no, no. We're talking about the saints of the New Testament. We're talking about us today. Even in Revelations. First, chapter, verse, sorry, Revelations chapter 5, verse 10. And he's been talking about us. He says, and you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now again, that's Revelation, so we might be talking any time today. But I, I do want to make it clear that God, when He chose us and gave us a new identity, He actually called us not just to be a second-class people, but He called us a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. I want to close with these few thoughts. It's in my understanding, having seen a lot of things, having seen things go wrong and right, that many of us are really unsure where we stand with God. And I know that many of us come to church because we know that's the right thing to do. We believe that we're going to be obedient to God and God will bless us. But I'm willing to say that in the deepest part of our heart, if we were to expose ourselves to God, we would find ourselves frustrated and angry sometimes and wondering where God is. And how come He's not listening to us? I want to tell you that's not the heart of God. That's not the way God sees you. I believe one of the biggest limitations we have with God today is the fact that we don't understand how much He's given us. And we think that God is not being good to us because He's not working with us the way we expect. Let me tell you what I've learned. We need to shift the way we see God. And I think things will work a lot better. If we realize that God saw us as His own kingdom of priests, a royal nation, that He sent His Son and He gave us His own image, that we are birthed, just kind of like the way Christ was birthed of the Holy Spirit by Mary, that we are of the Spirit. What is flesh is flesh. And like He told Nicodemus, what is Spirit is Spirit. We are of the Holy Spirit now. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the righteousness of Christ. We have the name of Jesus Christ upon us. That's how we come to God. So the next time you pray in Jesus' name, I want you to take a minute and think about it. When you close a prayer and you say, in Jesus' name, I want you to just pause and say, wait a minute. I'm saying it with a rightful ability to say it. I have every right to say in Jesus' name because God has identified me in the image of Christ. It's not just calling on God who is distant and somewhere in the sky. And if I scream loud enough or fast for three years or maybe for three months, maybe you'll listen. I'm telling you, He changed you into His image. That means you have every right to call on the name of Jesus Christ. That's why the verse of Romans says, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. Everyone. Everyone, everyone. Because it was his plan to make you like him. And if we don't get that simple truth down, it's going to be very hard. Because you'll be leaning on your own strength. You'll be leaning on your own understanding. And Proverbs says a funny thing. It says, lean not on your own understanding. I'm not talking about abandoning what you know about God. I'm saying to re-change the way you think about God. To change the way you see Christ. And the first change is to take a mirror and say, God has made me in His image, and He finished it with a cross. What I lost, God gave back. And the Bible says very clearly, what God has taken, no man can take from Him. John 10 says that God, nothing that can take from God what He's given us. It's in His hands. No one's going to take it back. Adam may have lost it, but the second Adam, Christ, has restored it. I want to close in prayer, but I want to close with this thought. I want you guys to just meditate. We're going to close in prayer, but I want you to just meditate on one of your deepest needs with God. Whatever it is, it's between you and God. Whatever your deepest need is. Whether it's just a reconciliation between you and God. Whether it's a reconciliation with you and another person. Between your, a family member or a brokenness in your life. I want you to believe, as much as God told me you speak to today, that God wants to prove Himself tonight. That God wants to show you who you are. And it's not going to be me leading you in prayer. I'm going to ask you to go to God right now and say, Jesus, my Lord, you've made me like you. 
I want to pray with understanding. Just whatever it is you had in your mind, whatever it was that was just seemed impossible to get from God, just pray right now. Just hold and pray. Don't worry about me talking. Just focus on God for a minute. Just focus on God and say, Lord, I realize that you give me your spirit. I'm conceived of the Holy Spirit. I am in your image. And now I ask, in Jesus' name, it has to happen. It has to happen. And you tell him, it had, by your word it has to happen. It has to happen. I am your son. I am your daughter. I am in your image. I am brought back in the family of God. I have perfect relationship. I am in fellowship with my God now. I am not jumping. I'm not screaming. I'm not coming across the table. I'm not asking somebody in disguise. I'm talking to my friend. And he hears me. And he's given me every right to ask. I'm asking you, don't leave this room until you come to God and you say, I need to see this change. I need to see this month. I want to see this change. This season and this resurrection season where Christ beat death. He can be a beat death. He can beat whatever you're dealing with. And this season is the best time to call on God and say, you destroyed death. It couldn't hold you down. You, nothing I got in my life can, hold, can be held back either. You can beat it. Lord Jesus, you can beat it. And you call on Jesus' name. When you pray against that problem, you speak to that problem. And you say, whatever that problem is, if it's a work situation, if it's a finance, if it's a health issue, you speak to that problem. You say, in Jesus' name, leave my family. In Jesus' name, leave my body. In Jesus' name, leave my parents. Don't touch them again. In Jesus' name, get your hands off my husband or get your hands off my wife. Whatever it is, whatever sickness is, in Jesus' name, get off my family. You tell God that. You tell that enemy that. Whatever it is, touch him Speak to us, say, in Jesus' name, I have the righteousness of Christ. I'm in the image of God. I have his name on me. I am recreated. God sees me as his son or his daughter. Now, in Jesus' name, get out. Leave. It will obey you. You need to know where your authority comes from. It's from Jesus Christ. And you have it in you. Because Jesus, the Holy Spirit, dwells in you. Just pray for a few minutes. Don't let up. Don't let up. Don't walk out of here without something that touches your heart. You need to know you're different.